All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Developing the Passport Learning Outcomes and Proficiency Criteria for Creative Expression. I am Kate Springsteen, Project Coordinator of Member and Education Services for the Interstate Passport. This webinar, along with all of our webinars in this series, is being recorded and will be made available at www.wichi.edu forward slash passport forward slash webinars by tomorrow, November 17th. If you have questions throughout the webinar, please type your question into the question box on the GoToWebinar panel and it will be brought to the presenter's attention. Following this webinar, I will be sending out an email with information on where to find the recording of this webinar, as well as a link to a survey which we would very much appreciate if you would fill out. I am delighted to introduce you to our presenters for today's webinar, Michael Phillips and Paul Wickline. Michael Phillips has been a professor of theater at Western Oregon University since 2003, where he teaches theater history, directing, and musical theater. He is also the artistic director of Portal Theater, which specializes in devised original work. Michael is deeply engaged in public science, exploring ways to communicate science through theater. Paul Wickline has served as the department chair of the theater program at the College of the Canyon since 2008 and the Outcomes Assessment Coordinator since 2010. He currently serves as the President of the Academic Senate and previously he served as the Artistic Director of the Walla Walla, Walla, Walla Community College Theater Program. Paul was also recently selected to participate in the AACNU Faculty Collaboratives Project. Welcome Michael and Paul. Thank Hello. You. Thank you very much. Well, this is Paul, and I have the pleasure of uh, discussing the first four slides and giving you an overview uh, to begin with of the Interstate Passport. So the webinar will focus on the process that the team went through to develop passport learning outcomes and proficiency criteria for the creative expression block for the Interstate Passport. However, before we go into that, we want to provide a brief overview of the Interstate Passport for our listeners. The Passport is a program that facilitates block transfer of lower division general education, which we sometimes refer to as LDGE during the webinar, based on learning outcomes and proficiency criteria. The Passport was a grassroots initiative originated by academic leaders with more than 50 faculty and administrators from 15 western states attending a convening in 2011 to examine ways to strengthen transfer within and across sectors and state boundaries, specifically within general education blocks or the LDGE. The Passport's overarching goal is really very simple, to eliminate unnecessary repetition of academic work after students transfer. So the Passport is designed to improve graduation rates, shorten the time to degree, and save students money. It's also intended to strengthen existing articulation agreements and support institutions' continuous improvement efforts. All interstate passport components have been designed by faculty, registrars, institutional researchers, and academic advisors. We're going to talk about that uh, to begin with today. The focus is on ensuring quality and streamlining pathways to graduation. So again, the purpose of the Passport is really to reduce unnecessary repetition of academic work in the lower division general ed after students transfer, with a focus on ensuring quality and streamlining those pathways to graduation. Now there are six major components of the Passport. Our focus today will really be on the two that are highlighted on this slide. The Passport Learning Outcomes, which we sometimes call the PLOs, and the transfer level proficiency criteria, which we sometimes refer to as proficiency criteria, or PCs. So these two components were developed by 74 faculty from both two and four year colleges in the seven witchy states and then vetted through constituency faculty groups in those states. And we'll talk about how we went through that process in this webinar. So the framework consists of or contains nine knowledge and skill areas 
that map to the LEAP Essential Learning Outcomes developed by the Association of American Colleges and Universities. Additionally, Witchy completed research into the general ed requirements in a number of Witchy states and identified commonality as the basis for the nine areas. The team decided early on in the passport development process that because of the considerable faculty-driven work that had already been invested in this project at AAC and U, the quality of the LEAP outcomes and the number of systems and institutions that were already using the LEAP outcomes, that this would be an excellent place to begin to build the passport blocks. So as I said, the passport framework consists of nine GE areas with PLOs and proficiency criteria, both of which we'll cover in the next slide, develop in each of these areas. So let me walk you through the areas. There are three foundational skills in, as you see there, oral communication, usually a speech course or the equivalent, written communication, a writing course or the equivalent, and quantitative literacy, again, usually a math course or the equivalent. And then we have four knowledge areas. And those knowledge areas consist of the natural sciences, which consists of astronomy, biology, chemistry, geology, physics, and others, human cultures, which focuses on history, anthropology, archaeology, political science, geography, ethnic studies, gender studies, languages, and others, creative expression, which we'll focus on today, which consists of music, visual arts, design, theater, film, media, literature, architecture, and others, uh, and then human society and the individual, sociology, geography, history, criminology, psychology, economics. And those four are the blocks for knowledge of concepts. And then we have two cross-cutting skills. And these cross-cutting skills may be embedded in any of the knowledge and skill areas or across multiple courses in any areas in an institution passports block. And those consist of critical thinking, and teamwork and value systems. So those are the nine areas, nine GE areas, that make up the passport. This is Michael now. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how this all worked and how we put these things together and starting with uh, how we came to consensus about the learning outcomes uh, and the proficiency criteria. Uh, the passport learning outcomes are just what you would expect them to be, just like a course goal what a student should know when they uh, attain the proficiency in each of the features within the PLOs. So, for example, this is an example from uh, the oral communication area that uh, a, a learning outcome there was to listen and critically evaluate the speaker's central message and use of supporting material. Uh, that's a learning outcome. That's what a student should know when they finish the course or when they reach the the level of proficiency. Uh, the proficiency criteria then are just example examples of different assignments that are actually being produced in the classes in various institutions. Uh, these are examples only, not required at all, but uh, just to give everybody a sense of how students might actually then attain their learning outcome. And so it's a statement of an assignment currently used. We actually went to our faculty who were teaching in the lower division general education areas and asked them for assignments that they were using in their classes. And that's how we developed the proficiency criteria. So an example from that, again from oral communication, is uh, that matches to the PLO right above it, is that they would complete an appropriate constructive peer evaluation or summarize the speech's main points. So that's an assignment that they would use to, that would help get them to the learning outcome for that particular area. This is an example uh, from another one of the, the nine areas. This is from critical thinking. And you'll see that we began this process with uh, three big categories. One was the feature column, which is on the far left, which is just a broad, general, one or two word idea that we're trying to get to with the learning outcomes. And so for critical thinking, those were problem setting, recognizing assumptions, evidence, evaluation, and context. And then in critical thinking, what the second column has is their actual learning outcomes that they developed. Uh, so for example, um, problem setting, their learning outcome is to identify a problem or question and its component parts. So if you look down to evidence, uh, the learning outcome is to identify, gather, 
and analyze the information and data necessary to address the problem or question. So that column, that middle column, the learning outcomes, is uh, the big important one here. The, the learning outcomes are what each one of the nine areas has to reach in order to gain a passport. So our team for creative expression was uh, brought together from seven different states. That's our beautiful picture there on the left. That's our team. And uh, we met in uh, Boulder to, for a two-day session to work on each one of these steps. So we met uh, in Boulder for a couple of days to work on the PLOs and then met again later to work on the proficiency criteria. We uh, are from California, Hawaii, North Dakota, Oregon, South Dakota, Utah, and Wyoming. And you'll see in the middle column that we had representatives from both community colleges and universities uh, through that group. And then the discipline areas that each of us had uh, are on the right. So from California, Paul was our representative in theater. Uh, Hawaii, they had somebody from English and somebody from creative media. North Dakota had somebody from music and on and on. And that's our team. That's how we came to work on all this material. Great. Thanks, Michael. So as noted previously, as Michael talked about, the, the passport learning outcomes and proficiency criteria were developed for all nine areas by 74 faculty from both two- and four-year colleges from the seven Wichy states. And then they were vetted through the constituent faculty groups in those states. For the purpose of this webinar on creative expression, we'll really focus on that area. So in California, we began with intrastate meetings between the two- and four-year faculty to create mutually acceptable PLOs and PCs, and then we submitted these in a template to the Passport staff who took all that information from each of the states uh, participating and created a crosswalk. And you'll see that in another slide. We then convened in Boulder at Wichy uh, with the other states to negotiate and select the PLOs for creative expression. And there was a great deal of dialogue, negotiation, uh, massaging, uh, wordsmithing of that language through this very collegial process. And through that process, we determined a list of five PLOs for creative expression that we'll share with you later. And we took those PLOs back to our state and our systems, and then we began vetting them, uh, vetting them, soliciting peer feedback. So, for example, I submitted them through, through various arts and academic senate listservs in California and received uh, some feedback, and then we shared this through several conference calls with the learning outcome team to negotiate the final language for the final PLOs. Uh, we essentially went through the same four-stage process with the proficiency criteria, so uh, mirroring that uh, PLO process for the proficiency process. And there is a passport review board that I should mention as well that is responsible for, among other things, soliciting and receiving feedback over time on the effectiveness of the PLOs for possible editing, redrafting as this initiative moves forward. So a little bit about the creative expression uh, process. So um, there, as Michael talked about, there are really three columns. There's the passport learning outcome feature or category, if you will, and then the actual PLO that he's already talked about, what a student should know or be able to do. And then again, I want to emphasize uh, the proficiency criteria is transfer level, so 100, 200 level, however, uh, your institution might choose to, to identify those. And these, again, are just examples of course assignments and exercises that a student might successfully complete to demonstrate proficiency in attaining the PLOs. They are not prescriptive in any way, shape, or form. They're just examples that we uh, pulled together and uh, vetted uh, as well. And then, uh, again, this was the process we undertook at the two different creative expression convenings in Boulder. Michael will walk us through the specifics of this uh, process, but we, we did some uh, pre-work in February 2015, interstate meetings, and over the course of a month then started to, uh, to address those and develop them. And I'll turn it over to Michael next. Thanks. Uh, so what you see on the screen here is an example of uh, the crosswalk that Wichi put together. Uh, 
again, as Paul indicated, this began with interstate meetings in each of the seven states where we came to an agreement about what we thought learning outcomes were important and uh, what proficiency criteria would be important to meet those learning outcomes. So this is an example of the crosswalk of the proficiency criteria area. And you'll see that there's a column for each state, Hawaii, North Dakota, and so on and so forth. Uh, the interesting thing here, though, is the highlighted stuff, uh, which is where we began to look across states and determine where there was some consensus about uh, either learning outcomes or uh, proficiency criteria. And we began to look and see where uh, we could, where there was already some common agreement across the states. And then we began to develop both the PLOs and the PC based on that. Uh, here's the second page, and you'll see that there's organs highlighted there. But that's the way we worked on both of these areas. Uh, in this example, uh, if you look at the far left, the passport learning outcome that we're using for these proficiency criteria, in this case, it has to do with histories and cultures. And so there's the learning outcome. It's right there on the page with us, and we can look across and say which assignments uh, are, that each of the states submitted uh, actually meet that, that learning outcome. And that's the way we progressed through this. We had a series of meetings. We mentioned uh, that our first meeting was all together in Boulder at the WICHE offices, and that was in April of 2015. And it was in that two-day meeting that we uh, got into a room and crosswalked all of the learning outcomes from each of the seven states and came to an agreement on five learning outcomes for creative expression. And then we had a whole series of uh, follow-up conference calls with all those same members that were in Wichita to begin with, or in uh, Boulder to begin with. So we had a meeting on April 28th, May 4th, and May 11th. And on that May 11th uh, meeting, we finalized the PLOs. Now, what was involved in all of that with the conference calls was each of us going back to our respective schools and vetting the learning outcomes with all interested parties. So all people, people from faculty from all the different discipline areas uh, and divisions. If we, my school works on divisions, we have a creative arts division. So the division looked at all of those also, and uh, that's how we came to agreement. We made some little changes here and there to the learning outcomes over the course of those conference call meetings. The, uh, we want to just mention each of the five uh, outcomes that we came up with. These are the learning outcomes. And again, uh, we start with a feature, an outcome feature, just a simple uh, descriptor word that talks about what area we're talking about, and then a learning outcome. And so if you'll look, this is our first one, basic knowledge is the feature, and then the learning outcome is to employ fundamental discipline-specific principles, terminology, skills, technology, and methods. And as Michael noted, the uh, we have five of them that we identified. One of the things that I thought was so interesting was just how much um, agreement that disparate faculty in various disciplines and across various states really had in determining what they believed were the essential learning outcomes for lower division GE in creative expression. And my understanding from talking with other colleagues re regarding the other blocks that there was a similar, uh, similar response or similar finding through this process that there was a great deal of uh, commonality and expectation. I think many of us were surprised at just how uh, at just how common uh, our expectations were in terms of outcomes and uh, proficiency criteria. So as you see here, here's one on history and cultures. We identified that as a feature of this outcome uh, and identified an outcome, as it says here, identify, explain, and or demonstrate relationships among societal, cultural, and historical contexts. Um, the next slide shows um, an examination of ethics, uh, demonstrate knowledge of and empathy for the diversity of values, beliefs, ideas, and practices embodied in the human experience. Uh, all the folks participating in, in the creative expression believe that, that was a very important outcome of this uh, block. Uh, creative process also was another one that uh, we had a lot of conversation about that we thought that 
uh, participants completing this passport block should be able to engage in a creative process through experimentation, reflection, tolerance for failure, and revision. And again, we're talking about everything from creative writing to performance in uh, you know, the performing uh, disciplines as well as um, creation in the visual arts. And then um, the last, if I'm not mistaken, is aesthetics and analysis use of appropriate methods and tools to analyze, interpret, and critique creative processes, works, and or presentations. I think that's the last one, or am I getting ahead of myself? Um, that's it. That's it, yeah. So I think that, you know, the important thing to note uh, as I finish this slide is, um, is well, I think Michael could talk about it when he shows the uh, creative expression block for for Western Oregon University, but uh, in many cases we felt that these five outcomes could easily be covered in just one or two classes, one or two experiences. So we didn't feel it was too onerous and certainly was appropriate for lower division general ed uh, in the creative expression areas. We want to uh take a little break a few times during the presentation to give you a chance to answer any, or give us a chance to answer any questions you may have. So now would be the time to uh, ask questions. If you have any, you can just type them right into your, your webinar panel and uh, they'll pass them on to us. Thanks, Michael and Paul. You guys are doing so well. I do have a question uh, right now. The question is, what challenges did the two of you face when you brought the draft learning outcomes back to your home institutions? I'll let Michael jump on that first and then I might, I might have something to add. Uh, it was surprisingly easy actually with uh, all the various disciplines that we have on our campus that because we have dance and music and art and, and theater and writing, all the, all the disciplines that would be covered by this this area is on our campus and uh, I simply found uh, people from each of those areas to run this by. They took it back to the department meetings uh, and they came back with some some small uh, suggestions for change which is what we dealt with in the, uh, the conference calls but uh, I was frankly quite surprised that it went as smoothly as it did. Uh, people seemed to understand what the what the passport was about uh, and they were in favor of trying to find an easier way for students to transfer. And so really on my campus, it was just small massages that uh, happened to some of the wording. Yeah, I would agree. I think, uh, you know, the, I think the work that each of us did, guided by, um, by Bob Turner and others uh, connected to which he really focused on large uh, outcome statements that that you could see various disciplines in the creative expression areas, for example, clearly could see those uh, within the, the outcomes. And the language was written quite, um, uh, quite accessibly. In other words, we have very active verbs, demonstrate, engage, etc. And that's common for all the passport uh, blocks and all the outcomes and all the passport blocks. So that may be, uh, you know, some of the, the advanced work that we did perhaps made it easier for us as we vetted it through our constituencies. Great. Thank you. Um, I do have another question. Uh, the question is, why is this a better or is it route than standard articulation agreements, um, which have already been negotiated and are already in place in many institutions? Uh, I would say, that, well, there's two things to that answer. One is that articulation agreements are uh, often completed. In my state, in Oregon, we've done it in two ways. We've we've done an overall articulation agreement uh, that agrees that if a student at a community college gets their AA, their two-year degree, then they can come transfer to our school and their general eds are taken care of. But uh, often those articulation agreements are between institutions and if there is a change to curriculum at either institution that, that has to be renegotiated. And we've all, we just found that, that most of the time when people transfer in, that there's a lot of work to be done to make sure that they're getting credit for what they actually did and that involves looking at their syllabi, making sure that 
their content is exact is similar to what we're doing in our classes. Uh, Passport kind of takes away all of that. Uh, it Passport simply says that if they are from a Passport institution and they gain their passport at that institution, then we will accept that passport and their gen eds will be uh, taken care of. They will not have to repeat coursework. And we don't even go class by class to articulate it because it's completely trust-based. We believe that if a school has done the work of making sure that their proficiency criteria meet our learning outcomes, uh, then when they transfer, their students transfer to our school, that they've done the work. So it's a much more, um, I don't want to say simple, because it's not a simple process, but it's a much more direct process for transfer than traditional articulation is. Yeah, I would, I, I, yeah I, I absolutely agree. I think the one thing I would add is that this also validates and values the assessment work that we have been doing for at least one or if not two decades in some cases in some states and provides now uh, you know, uh, assessments as transfer currency as opposed to course-to-course -course articulation. So it's in, that, in my mind, and certainly the colleagues I've talked to across the state of California who have been involved in assessment, it really validates and gives, uh, you know, gives us a reason beyond accreditation uh, standards, meeting accreditation standards, to use assessments not only to evaluate student learning, but now to use it as a currency for transfer. Thanks. Um, another question. Some faculty see this as a challenge to their academic freedom, even though Passport does not dictate how faculty teach the learning outcomes. How do you typically respond to that? Great question. Michael, do you want to take a stab again? Uh, sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't see this as a, as a challenge to academic freedom at all, uh, because how each faculty member chooses to teach their class is still up to him or her. And, uh, and the fact that, that we're just agreeing on learning outcomes, which as you'll see when we go through them, uh, you know, they're, they're, as Paul just went through them, you saw that they're broad enough that, uh, that a lot of different kinds of assignments can reach them, but specific enough that they actually have some meaning. Uh, but how we get there is up to each individual faculty member. That's why the proficiency criteria in particular are just, they're not even suggestions, they're just examples of different kinds of assignments that could do it. So uh, it should not impinge on academic freedom at all. Yeah, I, I concur. You know, in, in California, particularly at the California Community College level, we have course outlines of record that are approved, developed and approved locally and then statewide that um, faculty are expected to, um, to focus on. They have outcomes, they have objectives, they have content. Uh, the, really, the, the academic freedom is about how you approach and choose to teach that content that has been mutually agreed upon as kind of standard content in a particular course, whether you're taking it here at College of the Canyons or in Northern California or wherever. And, and that content also, you know, should be aligned with what is expected at the lower division level in, uh, in the CSUs, the California State University System, as well as the UCs, the University of California System. So, you know, we're used to this. It's kind of the mode of operation in terms of um, balancing that concept of academic freedom and uh, kind of a, per a prescriptive expectation of what content will be covered in particular courses to assist in articulation. And, and now, if you look at it through the lens of the WICHE passport, uh, in terms of outcomes, what outcomes are expected to be uh, attained at the lower division level in these various blocks. Thanks, Paul and Michael. Um, I have a few more questions, and then we can get back to the uh, to the PowerPoint. So, so the first of the last three is, did you expect that all the passport learning outcomes may be achieved by GE courses, or will they need to be supplemented by non-GE courses? No, all, all the passport learning outcomes have to be achieved by GE courses, and not just GE, but lower division GE. So. The passport is strictly for lower division general education, and we expect that all those passport learning outcomes should be able to be achieved at that level. Great. 
Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and I was not only in the creative expression group, but I also uh, observed the human society and the individual group, which involved sociology, geography, history, etc. And there was a lot of discussion about making certain, and I'm sure this was the case in the other blocks, that these outcomes could be attained at the lower division general ed area in all these states that were represented. So if there were any questions, and sometimes this was an issue, uh, one state would say, well, we don't cover that at all at the lower division level. That's really a, a, you know, a, a junior, senior, upper division level uh, concept or course or um, outcome. And, and then that was pulled out and, and, and or you know, uh, negotiated and changed to make sure that it was a lower division expectation. All right, so another question is, since the faculty groups in the various concept and skill areas worked separately, has there been discussion of possible repetition of PLOs? I'm thinking of the history and cultures and ethics PLOs in creative expression and some of the PLOs under the passport area of human cultures. On my campus, there was discussion about that, particularly between the um, the human cultures and human societies areas. There was a lot of overlap and, and in our general ed at Western Oregon University, uh, those are kind of all one big area in our general ed. And so there was negotiation about that. And But the, the, the mitigating factor there is that it's okay if a class uh, can meet the learning outcomes in multiple areas. Uh, in fact, that kind of cross-fertilization is one of the nice aspects of this, that uh, if there is a particular class, say, in creative expression that also meets a learning outcome in critical thinking, that's fine. And, and that can keep the, the credit load down. It can, it, there's lots of advantages to, to having that cross-fertilization. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and I'll be honest, we're about to construct our passport blocks at College of the Canyons. And that issue and that conversation will certainly come up. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm probably going to pull that uh, statement from Michael <laughs> and bring it forth to, to the group as we start to wrestle with that. But I, I absolutely believe that that's the way to approach it, it just as Michael has said. Okay, I'm going to take one more question and then we'll get back to the slides. Um, thank you guys for writing in all these questions. We will have one more sec or at least one more section of um, where we'll take questions. So continue typing them in. Uh, the final question for now is um, how do the PLOs and PC line up with the LEAP outcomes? Well, I'll, I'll jump in and, and just try and uh provide what I believe is the alignment clearly and, and certainly maybe Michael knows more about this or we or you know can drive people to the website which talks about this at some length the Wichi interstate passport website but they were used as kind of the framework for identifying what the uh, areas would be in the passport the natural sciences human cultures creative expression is etc which are based on the liberal education in America's promise um, outcomes that were developed and so there's a strong alignment because the LEAP outcomes were the framework upon which the, uh, the passport outcomes were then developed. So if you crosswalk those, you'll see a lot of commonality between the language and the concepts uh, expected to be covered, I think, uh, in the LEAP outcomes and then also in the passport outcomes. Hopefully that's accurate. And uh, Michael, feel free to add or correct anything you wish there. Yeah, the only thing I would add is that uh, that the, the passport learning outcomes are based on uh, LEAP areas, but they're not the same. And so uh, there's differences between them, but we, we tried to make sure that even though they weren't exactly the same as LEAP outcomes, that they uh, dovetail very nicely with them. So the idea is that that the by basing them on them and then, then kind of being conscious of dovetailing to them, that we don't think they contradict the LEAP outcomes at all. Yeah, I, I think it's probably important to mention that the LEAP outcomes are not just lower division general ed outcomes, right? So that's, you know, we, we had to think about it in terms of, and I'm sure Wichi uh, in the convenings talked about this as well, to make sure that we were developing outcomes that were uh, lower division GE. 
Okay, so let's move on and we'll have another question session in just a few minutes. Uh, so we mentioned the uh, meeting for to develop the learning outcomes. We also have meetings to develop proficiency criteria. Our meeting in Boulder was September 30th through October 2nd. Uh, we did the same basic process. We crosswalked everything between the states and then we negotiated each of them. Uh, and then we had a November 10th conference call to complete the PC draft and then a final conference call on December 3rd to finalize the PCs. So the proficiency criteria, and I, I just want to mention this again because it gets confused uh, sometimes. The proficiency criteria are simply examples. They are not required. They're not even suggested. They are just examples that we, we gathered from actual faculty teaching actual general education classes uh, that we thought would actually move toward the, the learning outcomes. So this is the basic description of that. I'm not going to read it to you, but it's a basic description of what the proficiency criteria does. And then some examples. So for our basic knowledge uh, area, the feature, basic knowledge feature, the learning outcome again was to employ fundamental discipline specific principles, terminology, skills, technology, and methods. And just to show you how we develop the proficiency criteria, if you look at number one, uh, demonstrate conceptual knowledge and creative expression using key terminology and principles in response to, for, uh, for example, concerts, theatrical presentations, exhibitions, dance performances, film screenings, or literary readings. Now, that sounds very broad, but what that was was an actual assignment in a class. So let's say it was a uh, film class, uh, that it would just said film screenings at that point, perhaps. And we just broadened that proficiency out so that it covered uh, that kind of assignment would cover uh, all the various areas in creative expression. Or if you look at number three, uh, define discipline-specific vocabulary in the form of a written assignment or quiz. Uh, again, an assignment that was already being done in uh, a class, and we went, well, yes, that would get to the learning outcome um, very well. If you look at ethics, Again, the learning outcome is to demonstrate knowledge of and empathy for the diversity of values, beliefs, ideas, and practices embodied in the human experience. And then if you look at, say, uh, learning outcome number two, or proficiency criteria here, number two, sorry, uh, examine creative works from diverse points of view, political, social, racial, gender, sexual orientation, share reflections and insights in a class discussion, paper, or presentation. So that's how the proficiency criteria works, again, just as, ex as examples of different kinds of assignments that could be applied to reach the learning outcomes. And we can stop there again for any more questions you might have about the proficiency criteria or anything else. All right. I do have another question. Let me bring it up real quick. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if the institution is truly unable to comply with certain outcomes, will that institution need to change curricula content? Um, will there be opportunities for institution feedback about difficulties with compliance? Uh, there's like three questions there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in order to become a passport school, you do have to agree to the learning outcomes. Those are non-negotiable at this point. Uh, there's another part to that answer, which I'll get to in a second, but you do have to agree to the learning outcomes. Um, the learning outcomes, we think, are, again, broad enough to be uh, reachable and to make sense within our different discipline areas, but specific enough to actually have some meaning. Uh, and so the, the, universe, uh, the school that is considering the passport would have to agree to those. There is a review process, though, for those. Uh, and so if we find after a, a few months or a few years that we're hearing from a number of schools that there's a particular learning outcome that is just unreasonable for their lower division general education, we can, we can review that. The, the Passport Review Board would take that under, under consideration because we certainly don't want to, uh, to water this down at all, but we also don't want to, to be in a situation where there's something that's unreasonable in it. 
And so over time, over the course of a year or so, we would look at that. And if we get a number of schools saying that uh, identifying an area that is just not reasonable, then uh, that there's an opportunity to review that and to change it. And we would reconvene the committee and we would look at that and take that into consideration. So yes, you do have to, the school does have to agree to the learning outcomes, but yes, there's also a process for, re for reviewing those. Yeah, I'd, uh, I, that's an excellent response. And, and uh, the only thing I would add is, and I don't know if this gets in the weeds too much. Uh, Michael, do you want to go back to the previous slide? Can you do that easily? Yeah. I mean, obviously, when we talked about the creative process, uh, needing to demonstrate that uh, or attain that outcome to engage in a creative process through experimentation, reflection, tolerance for failure and revision, we knew developing that, that that may be a problem for some institutions because they may just have survey courses as a part of their, um, you know, uh, theater appreciation, dance appreciation, etc. courses that may not actually do a generative work, may not actually create something. but. There was a strong feeling amongst all participants, I think, on that in that group that uh, just being able to talk about the creative process or being able to analyze something involved in the creative process was not enough. But I think we all recognize that that may be a challenge for some institutions. Michael, do you want to talk about how you guys address that? Well, you're going to talk about it later, aren't you? Yeah, I'll talk about it later. But I but I would add, and thanks for coming back to this because I meant to say something about that particular one. That that particular creative process feature and learning outcome is different than the other four uh, because it actually does involve hands-on doing something creatively. But the other aspect that we don't probably talk enough about with the Passport is that, that uh, it's very clear in the Passport materials that these learning outcomes don't all have to be met through traditional classes. And so let's say that, uh, that your school doesn't have any uh, creative classes where people actually make art of any kind. If there's a school out there like that, that would be a problem. This learning outcome would be a problem. But let's say that your school does produce uh, extracurricular theater or extracurricular, uh, they have extracurricular choirs, all of those things. Uh, the school can make the determination that that participation meets this learning outcome. It doesn't have to be done through a traditional class. That's just the way most of us think. But uh, in fact, things like life experience can be applied uh, if a particular school does that. Uh, and so there's a number of ways to reach the outcomes. But yeah, at, at the moment, these outcomes do have to be met in order to, to be a passport school. But again, some schools can be very creative about how they can meet them. Great. Thanks, Michael and Paul. Um, Another question, um, so when assessing the learning outcomes, are we talking about one uh, proficiency criteria in one course to address one passport learning outcome? And as a follow-up, in each course or a combination of two or more courses listed in the creative expression block, do they have to have proficiency criteria that meet each PLO? Okay, uh, so if I understand, yeah, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> uh, that, that again, multi-part question, um, and, a, and a very good question. Uh, can you can you read the first part of that again, Kate, just so I make sure I understand? Mm -hmm. Yep. So, when assessing the learning outcomes, are we talking about one proficiency criteria in one course to address one passport learning outcome? Yeah, let's pause with that. And I really, I really like Michael's approach when we did the presentation uh, this last summer, I think, to the uh, incoming passport uh, institutions. And that is that this is really not an out, this is not really an assessment uh, uh, process, but really an outcomes process. And, and really, it's up to the faculty and those involved in teaching these courses to determine how best if. If the institution has decided that a particular course maps to a particular outcome in creative expression, then there is, as Michael has already talked about, trust that you have assessments in place to measure the student's attainment of that, that outcome. How you choose to go about doing that is completely your choice and where, where uh, I think freedom, academic freedom really comes into play and trust is a big factor in that situ in that case. Is that, Michael, is that uh, something you would echo? Yeah, I would echo that, but I would also say directly to the question, 
that if you look at, say, those foundational areas, uh, so oral communication, uh, there are five learning outcomes, and each of those five learning outcomes have PCs that are all uh, within the oral communication area. But one class, uh, a speech class, can meet all five of those learning outcomes. And so the idea that you have to have a particular assignment that just meets one learning outcome within one area is not at all what we're saying. Because uh, not only can one class maybe meet numerous learning outcomes in an area, or all of them in the case of a speech class, but it could also meet learning outcomes in various areas. So a literature class, for example, might meet uh, the learning outcome in creative expression about analysis, but it also might meet a learning outcome in critical thinking. And so it's not a one-to-one. -one. There's not You don't have to have uh, an assignment for every single learning outcome for every single class or for every single um, feature. It can cross-fertilize again. Yeah, and I, I think that thank you for adding that. And we talked a lot because Michael and I are both theater uh, professors, and we talked a lot about the idea that really a, an introduction to theater or a theater appreciation course, if you have a generative creative uh, activity in which students are writing and or uh, performing some creative work, that course in and of itself may, if it's if it's designed to meet those outcomes already, may may in effect be the only course that a student needs to take to meet that creative expression. It's more likely to be a two two course sequence, as Michael will talk about with his passport block shortly. But I think um, certainly in in looking at the outcomes that we have developed and thinking about our own intro to theater course, I would imagine we could easily, with um, you know really no modification assess those outcomes within that particular course and have students take that course to meet those. I think that's very possible. Okay, um, so let's try to answer this follow-up question as well and then we'll um, move on to the next slides. Um, so the follow-up to the original question was, um, does each course or the combination of two or more courses listed in the creative expression block have to have PC that meet each PLO? No, they would have to have PC that met. Go ahead. Yeah, they would have to have a PC that met one of the eight PLOs, uh, but not necessarily at all. So, again, that's my that's why uh, a a speech class might meet all five of the PLOs within that block, but a, but a theater class might only meet one of the PLOs in the creative expression, or it could meet three of them, or it could meet four of them, or as Paul just mentioned. It's possible to design a course that could meet all five, but uh, yeah. So it just depends on what the PC actually does and whether which which LO it leads to. Great, thanks, Michael. Uh -huh. Ready to move on? Yep, let's move on. Okay, Paul. All right. Um, I'll talk really briefly. We want to cover this only briefly in this webinar because there are other sources, resources, and, and future webinars that can better address this with the time needed. But I want to look at this graphic and start at the top and work our way around this clockwise to talk about the construction of the passport, uh, becoming a passport instruction, which includes institution, which includes constructing the passport block. So notice that it says faculty there at the top of this graphic. Uh, faculty obviously are responsible and, and heavily involved in reviewing the passport learning outcomes for congruence with their own institution's outcomes, as Michael has already talked about. And then they work to construct the institution's passport block. And so I'm in the early stages of this, and I'm involving the curriculum committee, the SLO committee, the department chairs, uh, and others in starting to convene to develop, to look at our, um, our courses, our um, outcomes and begin to develop that passport block. And once that is complete, then the administration and faculty and others tend to be involved in applying for passport status. There's an MOA, a Memorandum of Understanding, that needs to be signed and sent on to uh, the passport staff. And then the next piece is really uh, involves advisors and marketers. 
groups, counselors, and others who need to inform and advise students about the passport, its benefits, its structure, etc. cetera. Uh, certainly registrars and institutional researchers are involved in then awarding the passport to the students through your use of your uh, you know, SIS system, your student uh, information system, and other, other research pieces that you might have to generate information and track information at your institution. And then finally, uh, there's a piece that requires the tracking of academic progress of the passport students. I'll talk about that in the quality assurance in the, one of the final slides. But um, that's a, a, the last piece of that puzzle, which again, registrars and institutional researchers um, work with uh, passport staff and then the National Student Clearinghouse folks on uh, tracking and reporting that information. So in the next slide, Michael will discuss how his institution has implemented the development of the Creative Expression Block at Western Oregon University. Right, so this is it. Uh, we had representatives from all the various areas in creative, uh, our creative arts division, plus we had uh, people from other areas like literature, and I'll talk about literature in a second because you're not seeing anything, any literature on this uh, in this particular area, but uh, and we worked together to come up with which classes and which 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 classes had the the profession proficiency criteria that met the learning outcomes that we could include. And what we did was break that into two different categories. And so at the top, uh, this category basically meets four of the five of the creative expression uh, PLOs. Everything except that, that uh, one that we talked about where you actually engage in art. And so things like art history, introduction to dance, uh, class in rock music, jazz history, introduction to theater, film, scenic art, uh, those are category one, and our students would have to take one of those classes, and then they would take uh, from category two either one class from the first six that are listed or two classes from the bottom group, and, and as it happens in most universities that have uh, things like ensembles and classes like that, there's variable credit at our university for those, and so uh, in order to get a kind of a similar experience, they would need to take two of the bottom ones or one of the top ones. So you have things like beginning design and art. Uh, you have musicianship, elements of acting, any dance fundamental classes, any music ensembles, voice class, technical theater classes, all of that. And so one class from the top and one to two classes from the bottom would satisfy all of the learning outcomes in the creative expression area uh, at our university. And in each of the nine areas, uh, did the same thing across campus, and we came up with the overall passport block, which uh, is a complete list of classes that students would need to take in order to get a passport. And I just want to remind everybody here, because this is one area that we always kind of get confused about. When we're talking about this, this is the these are the classes that our own students would have to take if they want to transfer someplace else. Uh, this is not at all what we're expecting students to come in with. They come in with a passport and their passport is complete because we trust the other university to have done the same work we've done. And uh, so this is, these are the classes our students would take if they decided they wanted to transfer to Hawaii or to Wyoming or to California. Great. Thank you for that uh, last comment. I think that's really important to emphasize. Um, I have one of the last slides. We're going to talk briefly about passport quality assurance. Uh, the passport, first of all, defines a minimum performance level on all components of the passport block as a C grade in each course included in the institution's passport block. So for a student to get, uh, you know, a, to get a stamp, they would have to, to achieve at least a C in that uh, passport block class. Uh, the passport is validated really in several ways. First, as we've discussed throughout the webinar, by consensus reached among the participating faculty in developing the PLOs and the PCs, and then by tracking student success after transfer for at least two consecutive terms through the National Student Clearinghouse. And third, through the use of the Passport Review Board to monitor the efficacy of the passport and make changes as necessary. And Michael talked about that when the question was posed about uh, are, are you stuck with these, these outcomes or can they be changed if they become problematic over time. 
or are shown to be problematic. And then fourth, through a, an evaluation research study of the passport impact through Rutgers School of Management and Labor Re Relations. So we have a research study underway that is going to look at the, uh, the effectiveness of the passport. And then finally, by conducting a pilot with faculty from multiple institutions voluntarily to map the critical assignments in courses selected for their passport blocks to the PLO. So currently, Colorado, Montana, and New Mexico are participating that, in that process. So there's been a great deal of thought that's gone into how to, um, how to uh, you know, uh, I guess prove or, or how to make sure that the passport quality assurance is validated and verified through this, through this process. So, in uh, conclusion and summary here, the question really is why bother to become a passport institution? And we certainly have cultures, uh, individual cultures at each of our institutions, and so the question is what's the real advantage here? And we think there's three, uh, that it really does facilitate transfer across state lines and within states. So, if there's two schools in your state that are both passport schools, this makes it easier for students to transfer from one to the other, but it also makes it easy to transfer across state lines. Uh, it eliminates a pretty major obstacle to transfer student success and uh, it eliminates the necessity of review of each of our lower division courses in individual articulation agreements. I don't know about you, but I spend the bulk of my advising time uh, advising transfer students whose credits did not articulate well. And so we have to make substitutions, we have to do all those kinds of things. The passport really does eliminate a lot of that. Uh, second, it focuses on quality for positive impact on completion based on what students should learn and be able to apply. So uh, the idea that we want students to succeed, that's our primary goal here, and we want them to do it within a reasonable number of credit hours, 180 or so in my case, uh, and we want them to to not have to repeat courses, all goes to this idea of positive impact on their ability to complete their degree. Uh, this generates data on academic success after they transfer, as Paul just mentioned, by tracking them, and provides data for us so we can continually self-improve uh, to make this work easier for students without com compromising quality, and uh, we think that's a, a really important part of this whole picture. And it, uh, we know that higher education is changing on a regular basis and quickly in some cases. And so assessment is a way of life now. And so this tracks easily with our current assessment. The passport itself is not an assessment tool. But it should, if it all works well, track easily with the assessment that we're already doing for our classes and our institutions. And it does, as I mentioned earlier in one of the answers to a question, it does include the possibility of non-course-based educational experiences. And that would be up to each individual uh, institution to apply that. Uh, I think in Western Oregon University's case, all of our passport block is class-based, but we recognize that there may be some circumstances in which a student could reach the uh, learning objectives without it being through a class. And certainly some schools that have creator curriculums might uh, want to look at that. So we think for those reasons, and again, uh, I should just emphasize one last time that this is really student-based. We want to help students get the education they need and want without spending more money than they should and taking more classes than they should, at least repeating classes, uh, and to be able to transfer as easily as possible. This is uh, just to let you know that uh, the website at the top is the Wichi Passport website. There's lots of information on there, uh, and so if you want to explore more of that would be the place to go. And then on this last slide at the very bottom, uh, you'll see that uh, both Paul and I have our email addresses there if you'd like to write us individually, and Kate, who is the host of this webinar, uh, her email is there as well. And so we can open this up to any last questions you might have. Thanks, Michael and Paul. Um, I know we're about at the breaking point, but I do have a few more questions. Um, and if you'd like, um, you can stay on and hear those answers, hopefully. 
So uh, actually, Michael, just to clarify something, a, a minute ago you mentioned something about 180 credits at uh, Western Oregon, and you're talking about yeah. corridor credits, correct? Yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's I should have mentioned that earlier. We're on the quarter system. And so uh, when you even look at our block, <clears throat> sorry, when you look at our block, it may seem like there's a lot, of <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of classes required, but of course those are quarter classes, so 10 weeks. So uh, a semester, and a semester system, uh, that would be less classes and about the same amount of content. So at our school, which is based on the quarter system, it's 180 credits to graduate. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, one question is, if the institution does not count performing ensembles as GE courses, will the passport still allow performing ensembles to fulfill the creative expressions outcome? The answer is yes. <laughs> but uh, the but is that the faculty at that institution would have to agree to that. Mm -hmm. So uh, again, if there is no if there's no class, if there's no credit given for performing ensembles, then obviously it's not going to happen through a class. But if you have performing ensembles and the faculty agrees that participation in those meets the learning outcome, that just has to be made official uh, as part of the passport requirement. Great. Okay. Um, another question is the, min the minimum requirement of a C grade could be problematic for some Southern community colleges that allow their students to graduate with a grade of D. I can envision a scenario where students graduate with a D or two but are not eligible for the passport, and this might prevent some community colleges from signing on to become member institutions of interstate passport. Has there been any, in discuss any discussion about how this problem might be resolved? That's uh, not to be not to use a cliche, but that's above my pay grade. <laughs> that isn't something that I've been a party to in terms of conversations. It's an excellent question. I would guess that somebody at which you maybe Michael's had a conversation about that. We have not. I have not. Uh, I had a brief conversation, but I'm not sure this is correct, Kate. So you may have to be the one to answer this. Uh, I think that that the conversation I had about it was. Um, Based on the idea that if we are if we are going to if this is going to be a trust based uh, proposition, that we're going to trust that if a student transfers to our school that they don't have to retake any of our classwork, then uh, it seemed to the people that were organizing this that the C was a, a good bottom yeah. for that trust. That if if uh, if we know that a student coming to us got at least a C in all the classes that met the learning objectives. So that's a certain standard that we can trust. And I think that's where it came from. But Kate, you might know more than, than us about that. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. can I? Let's go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was actually just going to ask Pat to, Pat Shea, who's the director, to um, jump in here so that we can get the most accurate information here. Um, Pat, do you want to jump in? Uh, sure, thanks Kate, and great job you guys. Um, so <clears throat> the question is about this C requirement. It is, a C is required in every uh, course or activity, if it's a non-course based activity, um, for achieving the passport because it indicates a transfer level proficiency. So the question was, at, uh, at a certain community colleges, students can um, earn a D uh, in some of their courses. So the point would be that some of your students uh, at that community college would earn a passport because they would have a C in all of the courses they took as part of the passport block at that institution. And some students would not earn a passport, uh, but that is the agreement <clears throat> that institutions participating in the passport, interstate passport network have agreed to. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I would just add, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, I would just add that, you know, one of our accreditation standards and eligibility requirements to actually function as a college in, in California is that the institution awards course credit degrees and certificates based on student attainment of learning outcomes. And so, um, you know, it would be really hard for us to allow something other than a C, uh, lower than a C, as a justification. We assume that if a student is achieving a C and passing the class, 
uh, the, and getting course credit for it, then they are attaining those outcomes. So that would be really difficult for us to uh, to not have that that as the minimum requirement. Okay, I'm going to jump into one more question. The question um, is, how do you track non-course based educational experiences? Well, first thing that pops into my mind is portfolio, but I don't know that it has to be that official or that uh, you know that mm -hmm. um, formal. Michael, have you guys talked about that at your campus? Uh, we haven't yet specifically because, again, our uh, entire passport block is class related. But uh, again, I think that uh, you know if you take a if you take a, a a school that has a fairly innovative curriculum, say Evergreen State College in, in Washington, where they their entire way of doing education is not the way most universities do it, and so uh, they would have to if they were to become a passport institution, they would have to figure out how. Um, all the stuff they do, which is not grade-based, uh, would have to be then quantified enough that they have met the learning outcomes. And it may just be that they set up a rubric for that, mm -hmm. right? Because the learning outcomes are what they are, and the question is, are we meeting them with all these activities? And so uh, I think that any school that would need to use non-course-based uh, criteria to get to the learning outcome would just have to set up a method for doing so. I, that doesn't seem to be a huge problem because they probably already have it in place, uh, some kind of evaluative tool. And if they don't, it would be as simple as setting up a rubric for it, I would think. Mm. Yeah, I would imagine you're dealing with a pretty small set of colleges and set of experiences that would qualify. Uh, as uh, evidence of meeting those outcomes beyond a course. I mean, that, that, that's a great question for, for the Interstate Passport Board perhaps to discuss. I don't know if Pat has anything to add. I, I think I have to think about that some more. Mm -hmm. well, I, I can give one example. I mean, if, if uh, a school, for example, does not have any theater program, uh, creative theater program that's credit-based, uh, and if a student, though, that's in their department uh, goes off and auditions and gets a role in a show outside the university, um, there probably would be a pretty simple way to make sure that the, the work they're doing outside the university in real life uh, met that creative PLO uh, of actually doing art. And I think that would be a fairly simple process to do, uh, but and that's what it means. That that last slide, if we go back to that slide here, that very bottom note includes non-course-based educational experiences, uh, even life experiences. We talked about in some of these discussions uh, could count. It, we just have to figure out a way to quantify that enough that we know that it's meeting the PLO. And I think Michael, you made a a good point earlier that um, while it this is possible, it is up to the faculty at the institution that would be awarding the passport to that student to evaluate that experience and determine that the student has truly met that learning outcome. Because the faculty at an institution awarding the passport has to stand behind. Um, the, the fact that they have provided to their students ways to um, achieve the learning outcomes at the transfer level of proficiency. Yep. All right. Well, I don't have any more questions here. I want to take the time to thank um, Michael and Paul for putting on such a great webinar. And I want to thank everybody else who uh, joined in on the webinar today. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Great. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Pat. Thanks, Michael. And thanks for attending, everybody. <laughs>